I think I can start by saying welcome to our audience. First of all, welcome, because we're so grateful to have an audience. <laughs> we're actors, and um, you are our favorite drug, an audience. I would like to thank, first of all, Emeritus College and Santa Monica College. And I would also like to thank Laura Lipson for setting up some of our visuals for us, and Mary Jo Robertson for putting all the visuals together for us, Joe Shapiro, who's going to be running this show for us today and doing our introductions, and um, Catherine Campbell, who is basically runs our classes. So um, every week she puts in more time running our class than I do teaching our classes. So we are so, so, so very, very grateful to you, Catherine. Thank you so much. And um, on uh, another note, we would like to say a fond adieu to one of our most beloved um, actors and classmates who died this past year at 89 and was in this class for two decades. Jim Smith, we love you, rest in peace. So everybody have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful show. And thank you again for coming, deeply appreciate it. Zoom class at Emeritus on a date. Uh, Ruben, are you there? Iris, hit your video button. <laughs> oh, there you are. I can't believe I've been doing this Zoom crap for two years and I forgot to turn on my video. Mm. Well, I'm flattered that you remembered me. Oh, I remember you from when we were in class. You were always checking me out when I walked by. <laughs> I didn't realize that was that obvious. So how have you been doing, Ruben? I hear that I was very sorry to hear that you lost your wife. Thank you. Thank you. I'm burnt out. I'm sick and tired of the pandemic. I want to take off my mask. I want to live again. Me too. Good. That's why I'm calling. I have scored a couple of tickets for the Speakers Bureau over in Beverly Hills. Obama is speaking next week. You drive, I'll buy dinner. You know what? I'll drive and I'm happy to have dinner with you. 
but I have no interest in hearing Obama speak. What made you think I would? Uh, I just think everybody in uh, emeritus is uh, <laughs> liberal. Not and, every. Uh, not everyone is a liberal, and not everyone voted for Obama. Uh, is it? You know, you know, he's going to be getting about half a million to a million dollars for that. You know, he's worth it. Is it because of race? Oh, please, that is so typical. No, I voted for Karen Bass for Congress. Then because of Obamacare? Well, not crazy about that. You know, my daughter went back to school in her 40s and didn't have any insurance, got Obamacare, ended up spending more than she did for California Blue Cross or whatever it was. I bet you took a financial beating when your wife died, right? Well, as a matter of fact, mercifully quick and uh, Medicare paid for everything. And my son, the doctor goes nuts with you Democrats and all your paperwork. And uh, I go nuts with all of you Republicans who won't have your shots and the pandemic will never go away. Ruben, did you ever live in a socialist country? No. You know, I did in the seventies and eighties. I lived in both France and England. And I'm telling you, I was a McGovern liberal before that, but that short changed me. Boy, imagine living in a country where the government is running everything. It's like being at the DMV all day and all night. Nothing works, including the people. Oh, nothing happens quickly. You can't even get a phone. We moved to England, it took us six to eight weeks to get a telephone. And that was before the days of cell phones. You know, and as for being in a store somewhere and trying to get some service, you'd say to somebody, where is such and such? And they'd go, oh, I don't know, over there somewhere. There's no competition. You can't fire anyone. So why does anybody need to help you? So consumers lose all their rights. So I guess uh, you don't care for Medicare then? No, I, I have Medicare. Are you still really happy you voted for Biden? I am overjoyed considering the alternative. Biden cares for people. Maybe, but he is so weak and ineffectual. He's gonna, he's scary. He's gonna start a war with Russia and China. He's too old, look how frail he looks. I mean, even the LA Times doesn't like him anymore. And the gaffes that he makes, you know what? I bet the people who write his stuff for him say, don't say a word unless it's written right there in front of you. You know, Trump won't start war with Russia. He loves Russia. He wishes we all spoke Russian. He kisses Putin's ass every day because he wants to build the hotel in Moscow. And the Republicans are dying because they can't make enough money on the war with Ukraine. At least people wanted to work under Trump. Come on. Our unemployment is as low as it's been since World War II. That's because you're still living on the scams from the unemployment insurance and the small businesses. That's because Biden cared for people. That was real leadership. He took care of people during the pandemic. <laughs> All Trump wanted to do was kill Mike Pence, which maybe wasn't such a bad idea. Oh, that's really nice, Ruben. You know what? All the Democrats were good at is giving away money. Do you know that Santa Monica just came out with its uh, yearly budget, 1.3 billion, and 50% of that goes back to the employees of the city. I mean, it's salaries, benefits, health care, child care, maternity leave for all. And I have no street lights on my street in the second most dangerous city in California. Under your guise, we will be paying 70% income tax. And I am pissed off because I am a communist or a socialist because I believe that billionaires should pay their fair share of taxes. And they do. But what is it with you Democrats? Why are you so anti-business? These billionaires you hate so much create jobs and employ millions of people. They are the entrepreneurs, they're the innovators. That's what this country was made of from. And why, why is it such a crime now to make a profit? 
and the unions don't get me started. I mean, they've ruined so many manufacturing companies in this. The, the American car business can't afford to make cars when they're paying $30 a day for a guy who you know sweeps up in the factory. No, it's, uh, it's nuts. Now everything's made in China, everything's cheap and disposable. And those disgusting rich people that you hate so much, they're the ones who endow our libraries, medical research, museums, and even PBS. The Republicans don't believe in medical research. They don't believe in global warming. I am afraid for the future of this planet. I am afraid of the future for my children and my grandchildren. Big talk. What are you doing? I mean, think of this as a bright future. Biden gets dementia and Kamala Harris, who apparently can't run her own office, becomes the president. That's disaster. No, disaster is people like Ted Cruz running the government. That's disaster. Big talk, Ruben. What are you doing besides sitting on your ass? Do you know in the 60s, I worked for Scope in the South getting out the vote. And when integration came to North Carolina in the 70s, uh, I kept my kids in school, in public school, when anyone who could afford it took their kids out. Talk, talk, talk. The 60s, 70s, 80s. What have you done lately except sit here and complain? Hey, if I had the strength, I'd be out there picketing. I give money to Planned Parenthood because look what you people did to Roe versus Wade. Oh, you know what? Your people want to let people have abortions at up to 24 weeks. Did you know that a fetus is alive and breathing at 24 weeks? Not my business. And the same people who would be out fighting to keep some confessed serial killer from getting executed don't mind killing babies. Hmm. And you people with your guns would take the rights away from the women if they thought they could get away with it. They thought they'd take the vote away if they thought they could get away with it. Ruben, did you see that thing about the coyotes? You know, those guys who go and take money from poor people to try and get them into the country. This guy was on TV saying, we love Biden. Come to the United States. Biden will pay you to have babies. The more babies you have, the more money you'll get. Come on. Where did you see that? The Disney Channel or the Fox Channel? No, on CNN. Do you know, do you know, Ruben, I immigrated to this country 50 years ago. I had to go through months of interviews. We had to get financial records. We had to even get like go to doctors and get medical, you know, reports on us. And we even had to get police reports from everywhere we'd ever lived in order to get in this country. But you were white and you spoke the same language, so they let you in. You know your latest idiocy? Now the far left wants to give maternity leave to everybody, men and women, a whole year, uh, you know, keep your jobs for you. Do you know this 89% of this country is small businesses? That's going to kill them. This is madness, and we will all pay for this. I believe you get your news from bumper stickers. Right, right. Do you know there's an ordinance in Santa Monica that you can't honk your horn? It's a misdemeanor. If, you know, I guess if someone's backing into you or something, you can honk your horn. But you can smash and grab and we'll watch you drive away. Just don't honk your horn. Iris. There's no sense we continue with this discussion because we're never going to change anyone's opinion. All we're going to do is argue. And all that I get out of this is it makes me horny. <laughs> you know what? Me too, Ruben. Why don't you text me your address? I can be over there in 20 minutes. Hey, and call me when you get here. <laughs> I got a space for you in the garage. <laughs> we are in the living room of Hollywood film actress Ms. Jacobs 
a demanding, needy, self-centered, narcissistic, and at times verbally abusive employer. Yvette, Ms. Jacobs' personal assistant for the past 12 years, has once again to remind Ms. Jacobs that today is her last day on the job. Oh, good morning, Yvette. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Oh my God, I tear is terrible. It's the way I make it every morning. I'm probably just in a bad mood, that's why. Well, this is my last day making tea for you. Why do you say that? This is my last day, remember? Oh, I'm trying not to. I told you every day last week that I would be leaving for Boston for a new job on Saturday. Today is Saturday. Well. I'm going to put you seriously. So why don't we just forget about it? My suitcase is here and packed, Miss Jacobs. Then unpack it, Yvette. There's no reason for you to leave. And this is my ticket to Boston. Hmm. Miss Jacobs. Don't worry, I'll give you the money back. I am going, Miss Jacobs, and there is nothing you can do to stop me. Why do you want to leave, Yvette? Haven't I been good to you? You haven't answered me. It's best not to say anything. I'll increase your pay. I wouldn't work for you for a six-figure paycheck. I've come to realize that my mental health is more important. Oh, so now you're blaming me for losing your mind. Well, I never, you are crazy. Thanks to you. Oh my God, the disrespect. This will all be over soon. Do you know why I am still here, Miss Jacobs? Um, out of respect for you. I feel that after having worked for you for 12 years, I at least owed you a week's notice. I could have just disappeared, left without saying a thing. You're not capable of such disloyalty, Yvette. Well, I am now. Oh, Yvette, come on, let's talk things over. You know, Boston is really far away. And how are you going to make a living? You know, you live in a mansion, mansion of a movie star. I'm wondering, are you stupid or just crazy? I am neither, Miss Jacobs. I'm just frustrated. About what? You, you frustrate me, Miss Jacobs. Little old me, fantastic me, Golden Globe winner, me? Yes, all those things, you. <laughs> I am not difficult. Would you like me to make a list of your faults? Well, how long is the list? Novel length. Oh, my God, uh, my attention span is so short, I only read children's books. Oh, Yvette, 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 come on, don't go. Oh, there's no one that knows me like you do. We're girlfriends, aren't we? I tell you all my secrets. And I wish that you didn't, Miss Jicks. I, I really wish you didn't. Oh, well, where am I going to find another Yvette? Another sweet event. Flattery will not work, Miss Jacobs. Well, what else can I do? You know, I can't do anything without you. Okay, I admit, I might be mean to you sometimes. And I know you probably don't like me. That's understandable. I pay people to like me. But you know what? That's never worked with you. How am I going to find somebody to put up with me the way you do, Yvette? Come on, why don't you just stay for one more night? One more night? That might be the night that breaks me. Well, you know what? I bought you all the stuff in that suitcase. You know, you're taking away a lot of memories. And I'm well aware of that, Miss Jacobs. So when I get to Boston, 
I'm going to burn everything because I don't want to remember this place. Well, what if I made you an extra in my next movie? It's not worth the money. Damaging my health? I'd much rather keep my sanity. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I wish I was more like you. I'd be so much happier. There, there, Miss Jacobs. You do have some good qualities. Really? Like what? I'll think about it on the plane ride to Boston. Write it down. And when I get there, I'll mail it to you. Oh, please don't go. What can I do to convince you to stay? Can't think of anything. With you gone, Yvette, I'm going to be like a fish out of water. Yvette, you know I don't even know how to write my own name, for God's sake. You'll survive. Have I told you that you're my muse? <laughs> oh, God, no. But please, tell me more. Oh, well, you are. You're my reason for living, darling. With you gone, you know, I might just die. That is so good to know, Miss Jacobs. It means that my time here was not a total waste. Are you really going to do this? Where is your dignity? Oh my God, I once played a girl who had no dignity and you know what, I think this is her. I saw that film, this is definitely her. Why don't I help you unpack? Have you ever unpacked a suitcase in your life? No, I was born into royalty. And that's why you think you can have whatever you want. Uh, yeah, pretty much. You are 75 years old. Stop being such a child. My fans still think I'm 55. So Listen to me. You have got to grow up and realize you can't have everything you want. Stop the whining and the acting and the stalling. Stop being so spoiled. Do you know what you can do for me? What is it? change now if you would like me to think of you in a better light just allow me to walk out the door i don't want to change so you'll leave i am leaving miss jacobs whether you like it or not if you try to prevent me i'll never come back but if you let me out the door kindly i i just may you promise Will you call me that? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what would we talk about? Every time we talk, it's all about you. Tell me, what is my surname? My age? Where was I born? Well, I don't know. I've got that information around here somewhere. Well, I'm off. You have a great life, Ms. Jacobs. Well, goodbye, Yvette. Mm. Oh my God, what a bitch. A beach in Hawaii, a wedding. We now pronounce Trisha and Karen mothers-in-law. Just look at those two. I can't take my eyes off them. Your Annie looks simply radiant. Oh, could your Bobby be more handsome? What a couple. <gasps> and the ceremony? Oh, every detail. The orchids. The torches. The starfish boutonniere. <gasps> to Bobby and Annie. To Annie and Bobby. <laughs> so? How long you think it's gonna last? Six months tops. Really? Robert and I were thinking maybe, maybe through New Year's. No, 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 it's gonna crumble. Once the honeymoon's over and they actually have to start to talk to one another, done. 
I told Bobby, I said, young man, you need to know one very important truth. And that is that women always marry beneath them. So you better hold on to this one. <laughs> Bobby's the catch. I told Amy, sweetheart, no offense, but you're going to have to keep that seven going because you snagged yourself a 10. What? Your delightful daughter is totally out of my son's league. Do you know what she did when Robert and I first met her? Cooked us dinner, but not just any dinner. An amazing crispy duck confit with a side of burrata and anchovy toast and just a touch of sherry. It was extraordinary. I made it. What? <laughs> I mean, I'll give you the recipe, but I sure hope that Bobby likes Cheerios for dinner because that's all he's going to get from here on out. Well, then he'll be lucky because that's more than he can make. <laughs> <laughs> but at least he's good with his hands. I mean, the way he surprised Annie and put their bedroom furniture together. Oh, my goodness. That must have taken him all day. Actually, it took me about six hours. <gasps> you did it? Ikea gives you one tool. The instructions are literally pictures. And still, he's paralyzed. I told him if Annie thinks you can't even build a bed, how is she going to think you can build a life together? So true. Of course, it's probably my fault. I think I may have babied him too much. Oh, I mean, how could you not? He's adorable. Oh, he's helpless, I swear. Now you're Annie on the other hand. What a powerhouse. That girl is going places. <laughs> yeah, like where? She changes jobs every six months. And then she has the nerve to blame me for not landing a career. Do you know what she called me when we were arguing over the guest list? A free range mother. Mm. Mm. Yeah. A free range mother said, I didn't set enough boundaries when she was younger. And that really screwed her up. A free range mother, what? Like she's some chicken I set out on the range. Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bobby had the audacity to call me a helicopter mother. And I said, well, excuse me for giving up a career, staying at home taking you to every baseball practice, typing every term paper, and apparently for loving you too much. They just don't know what we do for them. And do they let us make any decisions? I suggested chicken or beef, but no, they had to have vegan swordfish. Oof. And I suggested a Don Ho tribute band, which I found on Yelp. But no, they had to have not two, but 12 hula dancers. And you know what? They aren't all even Hawaiian because one has freckles. Oh, but I just love how they tell stories with their hands. Oh, it's such bullshit, all that ticka ticka maka. When the moon glides over the ocean, we'll be overcharging you for pretentious food that tastes like glue. I'm really so glad that my Bobby met your Annie on Timber. Oh, no, I think it's Tinder. Really? Mm -hmm. I thought it was called Timber, you know, like when you fall for someone. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it is. I, kids today have such a hard time. It's not like when Robert and I met. No, you mean like when we actually have to sit down and have face-to-face -face conversations? And went on actual dates where we talked to each other and got to know one another and took our sweet time because that's what it was. Really, it was sweet. Well, they didn't waste any time, if you know what I mean. No, mm. you don't think they did it on their first date, do you? Well, sex is the new handshake. And they certainly didn't spend that much time talking to one another because I asked Annie if Bobby was a Democrat. And she did not know. And I asked him if Annie was religious. <laughs> he said she does CrossFit. <laughs> <laughs> they have no idea what marriage is really like. <laughs> not a clue. Oh, and that hotel minister mm. giving such a generic sermon. Whatever you do, don't go to bed angry. 
Hmm, that one's such bullshit. Hey, I go to bed angry. I wake up angry too. Hey, I'm angry now. Woo. <laughs> Trisha, I don't know how to say this, but oh dear. What, honey, what? What I'm trying to say is who cares about losing a son, gaining a daughter? Because, oh God, what am I trying to say? You are the most free spirited, charismatic. I don't want to lose you in the divorce. Oh, I do. From the first moment I met you, I said, <laughs> No wonder Bobby is such a fine young man. Because look at her. She's gorgeous and classy and nurturing. And she's the kind of mom that doesn't make other mothers feel bad. But you, Oh my God, my first thought was, I wish I was like her. You raised an amazing daughter while still having a career and you're confident and you say whatever is on your mind. And I could never do that. And all I can think is I just wanna be around you all the time. Oh, me too. And you know what? I totally had a Thelma and Louise dream last night, except it was the two of us. I mean, without the lesbian subtext. But anyways, I love you. And I love you. I just wish our kids loved each other. Well, maybe they do. I mean, they look like, look at them dancing. They look like they do. Oh, they all look like that in the beginning. What are we gonna do? I don't know, but whatever it is, we're not going to let this train, train derail, not why we're driving it. You're right. We've got to take control. For their sake. It's what good mother-in-laws would do. Exactly. But how? Well, hmm. you and I are going to have to talk at least once a week. Oh, no, we're going to have to talk every day. And we're going to have to convince Annie and Bobby to get to know each other. Oh, I'll make Bobby sign them up for couples cooking class. Yeah, and Alan's brother <laughs> has a boat. We can get it on there and then we'll sabotage the engine. <laughs> oh, we can hire actors to play, to kidnap them and play, play yeah. them. Right, and yeah. hold them hostage. Yeah. In our shed. We have a shed. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. We'll get any pregnant. Oh, yes. A baby. Oh. oh, whenever a marriage is in trouble, it's always such a good idea to have a kid. Yeah, a girl. And we'll name her after your mother. Right. Mm -hmm. Evelyn. But we'll call her Evie. She'll have Annie's eyes. A Bobby smile. And Annie will learn how to cook organic baby food. And Bobby will learn how to build a crib. And who knows? Maybe little Evie will, will keep us together. But if nothing else, she'll keep us together. And that's all that matters. That's right. Trisha, do mm -hmm. you promise to stay true to each other as we manipulate our children into falling in love? Yes. And Karen, do you promise in good times or in bad to use our motherly wiles to keep them together? I do. And Trisha, do you promise that I will always get Christmas and you'll take Thanksgiving? Mm -hmm. One bridge at a time. To Evie. To Evie. We are in the faculty lounge at Croydon Preparatory School following the headmaster's inter introduction of new faculty members, among whom is the famous artist Dina Del Santo. Also present is the lively, mercurial, and often inebriated Janet Marcus, a longtime literature professor and poetess of some small renown. <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Janet Marcus. The kids call me Miss Mark. 
And now you say your name. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear you. Are you muted? I want you to hear my name, <laughs> but we were introduced. Oh, you, you mean when the headmaster came in and, and introduced all the newbies? I never listened to him. Uh, so what do you teach? Uh, art, honors. Hence the scarf. <laughs> and you? Honors English. Hence the hands. <laughs> Feel like a warm up game? Oh, oh no. no. I say a five syllable word that starts with A. You say a five syllable word that starts with B, and we keep on going until someone is stumped. Antihistamine. Antihistamine. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. All right, I'll allow that. Carolingian. Nah, you can challenge my word if you think it's wrong, but if you lose the challenge, it's an extra point for me. Carolingian. Divertimento. Uh, uh, that's Italian, not allowed. Oh, you didn't stipulate English. Of course, the game's in English. Carolingian, five English syllables, please. Dumb, dumber, dumbest. <laughs> All right, I'll allow that. Examination, F to you. <laughs> Is, isn't this the faculty lounge? Would you please permit me to lounge? Certamente, signorina. Thank you. Wait a minute. Some teachers were talking about you earlier. You're a very successful painter whose works I couldn't afford to collect. They say you were known as the icicle at your last school. And I have to ask, is it true that you hit a student with your cane? No, it was a teacher. <laughs> oh, interesting that you want to know about me, but odd that I have no curiosity at all about you. <laughs> um, I am interested though in teaching fine art, whatever that means. Uh, oh, now look at the student's work. I feel that this is skill. The dictionary says art is human creative skill. So if you accept that definition, this is art. Now, this one has something else. I feel that the key is that this one registers in my brain and in my heart. Emotion, is that the real key? The trouble is the words. The words are lies. The words are traps. Lies? Traps? Well, what about truth? Power? Oh, a picture is a lot more powerful than a word. Really? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Self-evident, created equal, shocking words in their time, powerful, and are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, unalienable, 
unable to be given or taken away. What a word. So that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. And the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners shall sit down together at the table of brotherhood. Words that began a country, a whole country, then protected it in a time of war, then dreamed it better, made it better. Words did that, not pictures, words. Don't trust the words, even mine. And a picture is... Oh, I have to actually say it. Say it. <laughs> All right. A picture is worth a Don't thousand words. Don't dare say that. Is worth a thousand words. That is bullshit. And you know it. If, if words are lies, then what is the truth? A picture? <gasps> Something you painted? Here's a word for you. Arrogance. And I have a picture for you. We are in the employee's break room of a trendy magazine where psychologist Dr. Schneck, who has been hired by management to find out why morale is so low, is interviewing Ms. Watkins, a writer at the magazine. I'm Dr. Schneck. I'm sorry, did you say Schneck? Yes. Wow, you know, for 50 bucks, I can put you in touch with a guy. He can take care of the people who gave you that name. <laughs> I'll have you know that Schneck is an old family name, it is of German derivation, and it dates back many centuries. Hmm, I see. So you're proud to come from a long line of Bavarian Schnecks. I suppose one could put it that way. Well, no supposing necessary. I just did. Not each his own. So, Schnecky, what can I do for you? It's Dr. Schneck. Um, or um, you can take this meeting a little more seriously. Fine. I'll be as serious as a heart attack. As soon as you tell me why I'm here. I haven't told you? No. Having short-term memory problems, Doc? No, but I've seen a lot of people in the last few days. And I guess I'm a little, um, a little, um, um... Never mind. I, I get a little uh, uh, myself on occasion. So what's up? Well, I'm a psychologist, and I've been hired by your boss, Mr. Wapple, to find out why morale is so low here at the magazine. Well, I could tell you that right now. What is it? You've taken over our break room. We get very cranky when there's nowhere to eat. I think Mr. Wapple feels that the morale problem started before I got here. So, Ms. Watkins. Oh, please, call me Tammy. But your name is Dina. I know. Then why do you want me to call you Tammy? I don't know, I've always liked the name. Just curious to hear how it would sound. You're not being very cooperative, um, Ms. Watkins. Why is that? I don't know, you're the shrink, you tell me. Perhaps you think this is all a little foolish. Bingo, right on the money. Can I go now? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Wapple does not share that opinion. And which Mr. Wapple is that, junior or senior? Junior. Oh, it figures. He's probably just upset about that suggestion box. Aha, uh -huh, so you know about that. Aha, uh -huh, who doesn't? You know, he sent around a memo asking everyone to start putting real suggestions in the box. You know what's in it? Oh, well, I've heard stories. Well, let me read you a few. Um, I think we should start using elves as reporters. They're little and they can get into places that big reporters can't. They also like to work at night and we can pay them less. Or this one. How about if we write all our articles in Sanskrit? Or this one. Well, this one suggests that Mr. Wapple put his head someplace that's not physically possible. These are just a few of the over 100 suggestions that had put it, been put in the box. Mr. Wapple would like me to find out who's doing it and why. Well, how do you plan to do that? By giving everyone a series of tests. And I can analyze their answers and that will tell me who's involved. What kind of tests are you talking about? Simple things like word association where 
You say a word and I say the first thing that comes to mind. Exactly. For instance, I might say black and you would say. Affirmative action. What? Why? No. Yes. Stop. Go. Please. Thank you. Stop it. I'm not doing the test. Oh, too bad. I was doing really well. No, you weren't. Uh, when I said black, you said affirmative action. Well, we're doing a cover story on it. It's the first thing that came to mind. You know, according to the rules, it isn't wrong. Boy, if you don't know that, you're not a very good shrink at all, are you? I happen to be an excellent shrink or um, excellent psychologist. Let's just move on to another test. You know what? I got a better idea. Let's not. Are you refusing to take the test? Yes. Why? We're not doing that word association thing again, are we? No. Good. I'll tell you why I don't want to take any tests. Because they're a waste of time. You know, if you want to know if I know who's been writing the suggestions, why don't you just ask me? Okay, I'll play your little game. Do you know who's been writing those suggestions? Yes, I do. Ask me who it was. Who was it? Me. Now ask me how many I wrote. How many did you write? All of them. Can you guess what the next question should be? Why did you write them? Very good. You know, you're a lot brighter than you appear. You know, I wrote them because Wapple Jr. sounds like a hamburger, doesn't it? Anyway, he's an idiot. He happens to have a PhD in... In, in business. And he's trying to make this place like a company. It's not. It's a magazine. You know, he's talking to uh, photographers, uh, reporters, ad people, layout people. Y you can't talk to us like, like normal people. We're a very quirky bunch. What he should do is he should hold a meeting and he should try to get to know all of us as we are or just stick to the money end and quit trying to change things. Why don't you write that down and put it in the suggestion box? Well, simple. Wasn't funny. <laughs> See you later, Doc. Oh, here. I wrote this suggestion for you when I was told to come here. Oh, my goodness. If I did this, I'd be in therapy for years. We find ourselves in the adjoining dressing rooms of a posh dressmaker shop on Fifth Avenue in 1936. In one room is Mary Haynes, New York socialite and wife of Stephen Haynes of the Park Avenue Haynes's. In the other room is Crystal Allen, shop girl and mistress to Stephen Haynes. Mary has known about her husband's affair for a while, but has been quiet about it until now. Deciding it's time to confront the situation, Mary goes to Crystal's dressing room and knocks on the door. I beg your pardon? I am Mrs. Stephen Haynes. Sorry, I, I don't think I know you. Oh, please, don't pretend. So, Stephen finally told you? No, I found out. I've known about you from the beginning. Well, that is news. I uh, kept still up to now. Very smart of you. You've gone a little too far. You've been seeing my children. I, I won't have you touching my children. Oh, for God's sake, don't get hysterical. What do I care about your children? I'm sick of hearing about them. You won't have to hear about them anymore. Once Stephen realizes how humiliating this has all been for me, he'll give you up instantly. Who says? That's all I have to say. Well, that's plenty. Maybe you'll find you've said too much. Stephen's not tired of me yet, Mrs. Haynes. Stephen is just <clears throat> amusing himself with you. <laughs> and he's amusing himself plenty. You're so hard. I can be soft on the right occasions. What did you expect me to do? Burst into tears and beg you to forgive me? Oh, I found exactly what I expected. Well, that goes double. You'll have to make other plans, Miss Allen. 
Listen, I'm taking my marching orders from Stephen. Stephen doesn't love you. He's doing the best he can under the circumstances. He, he couldn't love a girl like you. Well, what do you think we've been doing for the past six months? Crossword puzzles? What have you got to kick about? You've got everything that matters. The name, the position, the money. Nothing matters to me but Stephen. Oh, can the sob stuff, will you, Mrs. Haynes? You don't think this is the first time Stephen's ever cheated? <laughs> Listen, I'd break up your smug little roost if I could. I have just as much right as you have to sit in a tub of butter. But I don't stand a chance. I'm glad you know it. Well, don't think it's just because he's fond of you. Fond? You're not what's stopping him. You're just an old habit with him. It's just those brats that he's afraid of losing. If he weren't such a sentimental fool over those kids, he'd have walked out on you months ago. That's, that's, that's not true. Oh, yes, it is. And I'm telling you, if you plain truth, you're not going to get from Stephen. Stephen's always told me the truth. <laughs> Well, look at the record. Listen, Stephen's satisfied with this arrangement, so don't force any issues unless you want plenty of trouble. You've made it impossible for me to do anything else. Have I? Uh, you haven't played fair. Where would any of us get if we played fair? Where do you hope to get? Right where you are, Mrs. Haynes. <sighs> You're so confident. The longer you stay in here, the more confident I get. Saint or no Saint, Mrs. Haynes, you are one hell of a stupid woman. I, 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 I suppose I am. I, what am I doing standing here talking to you? This is something for Stephen and me to settle. Oh, what the hell? We are in the cozy living room of Denise and Robert, a married couple who have just returned from a romantic Valentine's Day dinner at their favorite restaurant. Well, what do you think? I don't know what to say. Are you surprised? Of course. Happy Valentine's Day, sweetheart. It's just, you know, I was kind of hoping for flowers or candy. But a funeral arrangement? Funeral arrangement? Well, sure. Don't you want to know your future secure? Our future? Our future. Look, honey, we'll be buried right next to each other in the lover's plot. Our gravestone will be a large heart with both of our names on it. And with the words, for they so loved each other, that true love will never die. Well, that's a little creepy, don't you think? No, I think it's romantic. And what if we don't die together? What if, you know... You die first and I remarry, or I die first and you remarry. What if? Would you want to remarry? Because I don't. You, you're the only woman I've ever loved. Huh? <laughs> That's sweet, sweetheart. But statistically speaking, men do die earlier than women, and? And? Well, and I'm not sure that I want to die alone. Oh. Well, I'm sorry. It's just... No, no. That totally makes sense. I guess I never really thought about it like that. I just thought, until death do us part and... 
And, and what? And I never really considered what came after the death part. I guess it makes sense that you'd want to move on. Oh, I don't take it like that, honey. It's not like I want that to happen. It's just, I'm being realistic. Listen, what about you? What, will, what would you do? Well, statistically speaking, I'll probably be dead. Yes, this is true, but... But if you weren't, if I died first, would you? I don't know. I guess if you wouldn't be upset about it. Oh, of course not, Robert. I want you to be happy, always. Well, okay then. Yes, in that case, I think I would. In fact, there's just one lady at work I've been talking with and she- Whoa, whoa, whoa. Excuse me? Oh, no, no, I'm not. I mean, we were talking about her situation. I'm not. No. She lost her husband a few years ago, and now she's remarried. And so we were talking about what that was like. It never occurred to me to think like, you know, about us. But now that you bring it up, she does seem really happy. I mean, like, really, really happy. I haven't seen her this happy in well, since. Hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. I mean, not happier per se, just happy for the first time in a long time, I think. And the more she and I talk about it, the more I realize that maybe there can be life after one of the partners dies. That's right. And I'm glad you think that way, Robert. It's just. Tell me again about these statistics. What? Well, you said, you know, statistically I... speaking, I'll probably be dead. But are we talking long odds or? Okay, okay listen. Just listen. <laughs> Whatever you do, just make sure that she's not prettier than me, okay? I don't think I can handle that. But you'll be dead, sweetheart. Yes. <laughs> but I will haunt you from the grave. Seriously. You have my permission to remarry, but the woman must look like a troll. Oh. Hmm. Okay. What about your sister? What? Well, she's single. She no, 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 no. You will not touch Christine. You will not date Christine. You'll not even fantasize about Christine or so help me. I will rise up like a phoenix from the ashes and I will cut your balls off, understand? And you'll be lying in this coffin next to me so fast it'll make your head spin. Oh, Jesus. I just figured she is biologically similar to- Don't even finish that sentence. All right. I'm- Fine. Christine's off the table. I, I'm just trying to think of women I know that would be... Robert, you're not supposed to plan this in advance. I don't have any guys in my mind. I just know that if something ever happened to you, I, I would want to marry again, that's all. Not right away. Not even in the next five years, but someday, so I don't have to be alone, that's all. Besides, this is purely hypothetical anyway. We're probably both gonna die in some freak hot air balloon accident or something. So there's no point in even talking about this anymore. Hot air balloon? But I'm afraid of heights, so yeah, that- well, so you should be because that's the way we're both gonna die together. Eventually, way off in the future. Look, Robert, I love you very, very much. And you're very thoughtful in your own way to get me this. But I wish you would have talked with me about it first. That's all. But it was supposed to be a Valentine's Day surprise. And it was, believe me. 
It was a complete surprise. Look, if it makes you feel any better, I will accept this from you, okay? And if we both die together, I would like nothing more than to be buried next to you for all eternity. But if you die first, I'm out of here. And I'm selling my side of the plot to the next highest bidder and I'm moving on. And I just hope the person I sell it to is not a snorer. Right. Or more beautiful than you. Bitch. Ain't no one more beautiful than me. All right. All right. That's true. So listen, if you die first, I'll promise you this, okay? I'll go and find a woman who's uglier than you. Not too much uglier, but slightly. And I'll move on down the road as well. Do you have any restrictions on how well she can cook? No. Good. So, kind of ugly, excellent cook. Hmm. Sounds kind of like you. Well, I guess there's only one solution then. What's that? We're both going to have to live forever. Oh. I like the sound of that. We are in a bar in a small town in upstate New York after the memorial service for their much beloved mother. Siblings Jean, a widow, and Alice, married with children, are confronting the future of their newly widowed father, Tom, a man neither of them love. Alice sees a very clear and decisive choice about what to do with dad. But Jean, who was planning to move to California and get married, faces a dilemma. Okay. Hmm. Now, shouldn't we be getting home to dad? <clears throat> I suppose so. But I'm not ready to go home yet. Let's just sit here. Well, you've had quite a day. <clears throat> I'm sorry for blowing off, but damn it, Alice. Her mother died this morning. I've wanted to talk about her, but she hasn't been mentioned except as my inspiration, which is, which is dad's cue to start the story of his life. Hmm. No, I'm so sorry you had to take it all alone. Well, <laughs> I'm glad as hell you're here. And I'm glad for the chance to get out of the house to come meet with you but I am so tired of people coming up to me and saying, your dad's a remarkable man. I mean, nobody talks about mother. Just he's a remarkable man. Christ, you would think he died. Hmm. What to say to them? My mother was a remarkable woman. You don't know my father. You only know that man that was in the newspapers and he's a selfish bastard. You don't know the bite of his sarcasm. The night he banished you, my sister, for marrying a Jew did not get into the papers. I mean, well, what a night that was. Mother running from the room sobbing and you shouting at him and storming out. Oh, well, that was, yeah, I would storm out and you would be, uh, throw up. I mean, that was uh, pretty much the pattern. I know I'm being unfair, but you know, I wanted to turn to him all day and say, for Christ's sakes, will you for once just shut up about your miserable childhood and say something about mother? <laughs> but, no, I, I, I can't say that. He, he's an old man and my father and his wife just died. Oh, God, I'm sorry. That's all right. No. Mother loved your flowers. I felt guilty about mother all the way coming here. I should have been there more. I should have invited her more. Should have brought the kids more. Instead, I brought flowers. But you were so good to her. You made her life. Last night, he asked me to stay with him. And I didn't, I couldn't. And I'm ashamed of that now. Have you called California? 
Yeah, we'll we'll have to start looking with you know start thinking about dad, what we're going to do about him. Well, Alice, what are we gonna do? Well, I think you should get married again and move to California. But I might as well get this off my chest. It would be murder if he came to live with us. And besides, he wouldn't do it anyway, knowing how he feels about my husband. And the kids can't stand the way he's always yelling at them and telling them what to do. Well, I, th I think you're right. And that would never work, but I just can't tell you what it does to me to see a man that's so distinguished just become a nuisance. You know, I, I know I might sound hard, but he's had his life. And as long as we can make sure he's taken care of, I mean, I'll feel some guilt and you maybe more, but my responsibility is to my husband and my children. Yes, that's your responsibility. And your responsibility is to yourself to get married again and away from all the memories of Carl. Have you called California? No. Oh, Jean, my sister, my friend. Look, Alice. Get out of here. Look, Alice, your situation is quite different. Mine, it's very complex. I mean, you fortunately see things very clearly, but it's not so easy for me. We, we always remember the terrible things about dad, but I've been trying to remember some of the others, like how much he did for us. Ugh, well, I do a lot for my kids. I don't expect anything at the other end. You know, we could get him a full-time housekeeper. You know, he can afford it. He never agree. Well, it's either that or putting him in a home. You know, and we might as well face it. His mind is going, and sooner or later, we're going to have to think about a power of attorney. And, you know, perhaps even committing him into an institution. Uh, this, is, this is all so ugly. Yes, my gentle Jean, a lot of life is. Hey, now, look, don't go trying to make me out to be some kind of soft-hearted. Uh, I, I know life is ugly. I, I think you do, but you work like a Trojan to deny it and make it not so. You know, he threw me out. He said he never wanted to see me again because I married a Jew. And he broke mother's heart over that for years. You know, he was mean. He was unloving. He beat the hell out of you when you were a kid. And you've hated him all your adult life. But still, he's my father. And what's happening to him is appalling to me. Well, we've got a practical problem here. It's not all that simple. It's just not. Well, to me, it is. I will talk to him tomorrow and uh, I, you know, about getting a housekeeper and uh, just let me handle it. I'll do the dirty work. You know, only when he turns to you, don't give in. Well, uh, you know, I just can't tell you how ashamed I feel not to say, Papa, come live with me, you know? I, I need to love him. I, I have always wanted to love him. You know, we've got a practical problem that I'm trying to work out. Look, Alice, let's just leave it. Just leave it the way it is. With you staying on? Yes, you can go with a clear conscience. My conscience is clear. I am doing this because I want to. You're doing this because you can't help yourself. Look, if I wanted to be analyzed, I'd pay for it. But I saw how, how you just cowered when, when he started to rage. You know, yeah, he was raging, but I was shrinking at the ugliness of what was happening. No, you're staying because you can't stand up to his wrath. You know, the day you say, Dad, I'm leaving, but you've never been able to stand up to his anger. Ugh, he's just always cowed you. Look, Alice. 
you know, he'll call you ungrateful. You'll believe him. He'll lash out at you with his sarcasm. Well, yeah, well, what do you want us to do? Let it be known that we, Alice and Jean, have done all we can do to make this old man happy in his old age without inconveniencing ourselves. Hmm. You know, the difference between us is that I can accept, you know, the inevitable sadness of this world without a personal sense of guilt. But you don't. I don't think anyone expects either one of us to ruin our lives for this unreasonable old man. It's not going to ruin my life. It is. A few weeks, a month. Forever. Alice, let's not go on discussing this. I know what I'm going to do. Maybe I can't explain my reasons to you. I just know that I can't do anything else. Huh. Yale professor Bella Baird's life has become routine until it is suddenly upended by a cancer diagnosis and a young man. Christopher Dunn, a brilliant but enigmatic student in her creative writing class. A middle-aged professor of undergraduate creative writing at a prestigious Ivy League university appears before an audience of strangers. Is this audience friendly, she wonders? Merciful? Or are they easily distracted? Shortly after the beginning of my 10th tenured year at Yale, sharp stomach pains drove me to the emergency room where I sustained a rupture in my lower intestine. A few days later, while recovering from emergency surgery, I underwent a series of tests which revealed that my stomach was riddled with the constellation of tumors. Yes. They were malignant, and yes, the cancer was somewhat advanced. My name is Bella Libert. I'm 53 years old. I have no children, and I've never been married. Both my parents are dead. My father suffered a fatal heart attack at 62, and my mother died of stomach cancer at the age of 54. My class, Reading Fiction for Craft, is a requirement for aspiring creative writing majors. The first novel we always read at the beginning of the fall term is Crime and Punishment. Discussions about Raskolnikov, Dostoevsky's anti-hero, never disappoint. I'm always surprised by who connects with him, especially after he commits two grisly murders. One day, while the class was engaged in a lively discussion about the murder of the pawnbroker and her sister, a young man named Christopher Dunn said, Someday I'm going to write a moment like that. Blurted it from the back row, his statement silenced the class for a solid minute. It was as if someone threw a dinner plate right into the middle of the room. Someday I'm going to write a moment like that. Just saying it out loud takes courage. Can I talk to you, Professor Baird? Christopher Dunn hovers at the threshold of my office. At the beginning of the term, one of the first things I tell my students is that office hours are by appointment only. Do me a favor. The next time you want to show up without an appointment, at least shoot me an email first. The following day, at 3 p.m. sharp, Christopher Dunn shows up at my office again, without an appointment. He just waltzes in. He sits down across from me and unprompted tells me the story of his novel. It concerns a young man much like himself, a Yale freshman from Vermont, who instead of going home for Thanksgiving, takes the Metro North into New York City and commits a murder. And then Christopher tells me that after he signed up for my class, he read my novel. I loved your novel, Professor Baird. 
Bella. I loved your novel, Bella. It's one of the best things I've ever read. And then he does this. We came off and after that, we had a meal. And then three days go by and a fourth. Christopher doesn't come see me during office hours. The following week in class, he seems distant. After the writing exercise, while he's packing up his things, I approach him. Hey, I say. He says, hey. I ask him how he's been. He says that his novel's sort of taking over his life. That's great, I hear myself reply. I tell him that I noticed during class he appears to be somewhere else. You seemed adrift, I say. He replies, I just can't stop thinking about it. Your novel, I offer. Yeah, that, he says. As he turns to leave, I tell him that I miss our talk. And I ask him if I've done anything wrong. Not at all, he says. I say, Christopher, look at me. I'm startled by the sound of my voice, its sudden intensity. You've done nothing, he says. And then he leaves. That night, I stop by Anna Liffey. It's an Irish pub on Whitney Avenue. I'm sitting at the bar having a glass of red wine when a man to my right says, strikes up a conversation. His name is Clint and he's a contractor and by the second glass of wine I let him take me back to his motel room at the Econo Lodge and we have sex in the classic missionary position with the TV on. Everybody loves Raymond. I think of Christopher Dunn. A week later, I would collapse in my living room. While recovering at the hospital, I received a card. On the front was a picture of Dostoevsky, and inside, written with impressive penmanship in black ink, it reads, Professor Baird, I heard you've been going through a difficult time. I hope you're feeling better. You're missed in class. Your replacement is a graduate student who thinks that Dostoevsky was writing Christian propaganda and that Raskolnikov was a latent homosexual. He clearly loves listening to the sound of his own voice. I'd rather listen to yours. Come back soon. Sincerely, Christopher Dunn. The consultation with my oncologist yields only the grimmest of prospects. The tumors are rampant. I ask him what my odds are. He says they're very low. I spend the next two days scouring the internet, trying to find the most painless ways to commit suicide. I invite Christopher Dunn for dinner. I invited you tonight because I'd, uh, I'd like you to help me die. I explain to him about the severity of the cancer. I tell him about my mother. I explain the three-part process. And I tell him how success is impossible without an injection, buddy. I'd like to do this tonight. I realize it's a lot. I don't have the perfect thing to say. But you barely know me. I think I do, though. Okay. Okay, what? Okay, I'll help you. But first, you have to read my novel and give me your word, no bullshit, no forced professorial flattery. I begin reading his novel. Forgive me if I start to fade. I've taken a Percocet. Promise me no bullshit. I tell him his sentences are stunning, that his dialogue is sharp and essential. Ugh, it's clumsy. There's nothing clumsy about it. It's tragic 
and mysterious. You managed to make me root for a murderer, and I can't explain why. I remember going over to the refrigerator and taking out the three clearly marked hypos out of the butter cubby. I remember him helping me lay down on the bed just before he's going to inject me with the sodium pentobarbital, Christopher asked me if I'm absolutely sure that I want to do this. I'm absolutely sure, I say. When I awaken some 17 hours later, Christopher is gone. The second and third hypos are resting on the chair where he sat beside my bed. The syringe is still full, untouched. I shuffle off to the kitchen and I see the stationery box containing Christopher's novella is still on the table. I remove the lid, I read the cover page. I only half noticed it the first time. To lie face down in a field full of snow. Christopher doesn't come to class that week. His body was found by a fellow student in the New Haven Green in the middle of the night. He was lying face down in the snow. Because of death, hypothermia. I start chemotherapy in January. Six months later, my oncologist informs me that the tumors in my abdomen have all but disappeared. He says he's never seen anything like it. He sounds disappointed. I feel as if I'll live forever. For the better part of a month, I read and reread Christopher Dunn's novella. I'm still struck by the ending. Christopher leaves his reader with an ellipsis, three successive periods. Did he slip and fall? Did he collapse from exhaustion? Did some vital pinion inside him snap in half from frustration or jealousy? or endless yearning? Or was it a matter of the heart, even more treacherous than that? Loneliness. We find Brian and Linda in Linda's apartment on a typical evening. Linda is absorbed in her work, and Brian, for some reason, is having trouble concentrating on his brochure. Question. Okay. How long have we been together? Eight months. That's right. <laughs> but that's not the question. Honey, I've I got to read this stuff for work. I'm sorry, I'm distracting you. No, that's okay. If you've got something on your mind, I, I want to know what it is. When did we first say I love you? Four months ago. Right. I know. You cried. I was happy. So was I. So, that's still not the question. Honey, just ask your question. I'm sorry, it's not exactly easy. Oh my God, 
God, stop it. Is it bad? You're, you're scaring me, Brian. It's scary. I'm scared to ask it. Just ask your question. Okay, but I feel like I should get down on one knee to ask. Linda, I've been wanting to ask you this for so long. Well, what would you do if the zombies attacked? What? What would you do if zombies attacked? I'm sorry, I don't know what you mean. The zombies, if they attacked, what would you do? What zombies are you talking about? Any zombies, any and all zombies, a horde of zombies from the cemetery, whatever. This is what you wanted to ask me? Yes. Why are you asking me this? Because it's important. No, no, it's not. Yes, it is. Why? Why is it important? Because I love you and I'm ready to turn our relationship to the next level. You want to get married? Whoa, wait a minute. Are you asking me to marry you? No, I thought you were asking me to marry you. I was talking about zombies. Brian, what, what did you mean the next level? You know, the, the next level, the level above the current level. Move in together? Aha. Uh -huh. Well, okay. You know, I, I'm not sure. I'm afraid. You're afraid of zombies? Well, you didn't come to zombie night. Oh, you're mad about zombie night. I'm not mad. You said it was okay if I didn't come to zombie night. Why would you skip zombie night? It was awesome. Why didn't you want to come? I don't like zombie movies. They're, they're gratuitous. It happens to be a viable genre. They're disgusting. They are quite often a very pointed and highly savvy commentary on the mindless consumerism of late 70s, early 80s, middle America. No, they're not. But I love them, Linda. I love them. I love them. I love them. Okay, okay. I, oh, I'm glad you love them. I love modern dance. That's not really dancing. They're just hopping around. Anybody can do that. But, and I am being honest, I have great fear about making it work with a woman who has no zombie plan. A, a zombie plan? Yes. A small amount of thought given to a possible plan of escape should the dead rise from the grave and begin to walk the earth. Brian, I, I don't have a zombie plan. I know. I'm sorry, I've ruined everything. It's too soon. I'm sorry, it's too... I'll go. It, you're leaving? Yes. I'm pushing you and I promised myself I wasn't going to do that. Flamethrowers! Flamethrowers! What? We get flamethrowers! No, no, flamethrowers won't do us any good. They're zombies. They're not going to stop just because they're on fire. No, listen, listen. I've got a flamethrower. You run and get a baseball bat out of the whole closet. And then you stand by the door. And, like, they're all around us by now, right? Yeah, completely surrounding the house and probably breaking through the barricades that we set up in front of the windows at this point. Okay, so you stand at the front door. I open the door. You run out swinging the bat at everything that moves. And, and, and then we, we make it to the car and I jump in the back seat 
and you drive. Keep talking. Okay, okay. You start the car with wheels spitting, with smoke coming off the wheels and everything, and like they're they like chasing us by now, right? Yeah, yeah, they're chasing us, all right. Okay, so then I pop up out of the sunroof with this flamethrower, and I blast those bastards back to the graves that spawn them. And they can't catch us because we're in the car, right? And they're, they're not superhuman or anything. No, they aren't any stronger or faster than normal humans. And we escape this time. That could work. And then we join, we find the resistance movement and we join up. Seriously? Yep. <laughs> you would join the resistance movement? Brian, the world is crawling with the living dead. We have to find the last bastion of humanity and align ourselves with them. And besides, if our species is to survive, we've got to learn to work together. Oh my God, that is so true. <sighs> I love you. I love you too. Yay! Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Did I? We are in newly wedged Kavari and Paul's charming apartment overlooking Washington Square Park. Earlier in the evening, Paul, an uptight button-down attorney watched Corey, his much younger, fun-loving, up-for-anything wife, walk barefoot through the park in New York winter snow. Oh, what I'm really concerned about is you! Me! <laughs> Me! I'm beginning to wonder if you're even capable of having a good time! Why, why, why? Because I like gloves in the wintertime? No, no! Because there, there isn't the least bit of adventure in you. Do you know what you are? You're a, you're a, you're a watcher. There are watchers in this world and there are doers. And the watchers just sit around watching what their doers do. Well, tonight you watched and I did. Yeah, well, I gotta watch you. It, I, I, listen to me. It was harder for me to watch what you did than it was for you to do no, it while I was watching. You won't even let your hair down for a minute. You can't even relax for one night, boy, Paul. Sometimes you act like a... You... What? 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 A stuffed shirt? Oh, I didn't say that. Well, that's what you're implying. Well, that's what you're anticipating. I didn't say that you're a, you're a stuffed shirt, but you're, you're extremely proper and, and dignified. <laughs> I'm proper and dignified. <laughs> When was I proper and dignified? All right. The other night at Delfino's, you were drunk, right? Yeah, I, w I was stoned. Well, there you go. Like, I didn't know it until you told me in the morning. You know, you're a funny kind of drunk. You just sat there looking unhappy and watching your coat. Well, I was watching my coat because because I was, somebody else was watching my coat. Look, if you want, I'll get drunk for you sometime. Oh, no, no, no. I'll show you, I'll show you a slob, make yes. your hair stand on it. That's not necessary. Do you know, do you know that a couple of years ago at a New Year's Eve party, I punched an old oh. woman. So oh. don't, don't tell me about drunks. All right, Paul. Right. All right, so when else? What oh. else, what is I proper oh. and dignified? Always, always, you're always dressed right. You always look right. You always say the right thing. You're very close to being perfect. That, that's a rotten thing to say. I've never seen you without a jacket. And I always feel like, like a slob compared to you. And before we were married, I was pretty sure you slept with a tie. Oh, that's ridiculous. Uh, that's you're ridiculous. not? That's just the trouble. Like tonight. You wouldn't walk a barefoot with me in Washington Square Park. Why not? Very simple. 
It was 17 degrees well, out exactly. there. Exactly. That's very sensible and it's logical. Except it isn't any fun. Well, you know what? Maybe I am too proper and dignified for you. Maybe you'd be happier for like someone a little more, oh, I don't know, colorful, flamboyant. Oh, you know, like oh, that geek guy oh, you know? He'd be a lot more laughs than a stuffed shirt. No, 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 no. Come on. You said I wasn't. No, no, you are now. Well, you know what? I'm not going to listen to this. I'm not going to listen to this. Wait, 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 wait. Where, I, where are you going? I've got a piece in the morning. Where are you going? I'm going to sleep. Now? <laughs> How can you sleep now? I'm going to close my eyes and count knishes. Good oh, night. Oh, that just, that gets me insane. You, you can even control your emotions. Oh my God, look, I'm just just as, as upset as you are. But when I get hungry, I eat. And when I get tired, I sleep. Now, you no, no, no. eat and sleep too, come on. No, 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 I'm not it. in the middle of a crisis. What crisis? We're yelling a little. You don't consider this a crisis? <laughs> a whole marriage hangs in the balance. What? It does? Wait a minute, when did that happen? Just now. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly very, very clear to me. You and I have absolutely nothing in common. Why? Why? Because I won't walk <laughs> barefoot in the park? Oh, no. Corey, Corey, <laughs> come on. You haven't got a case. Adultery. Well, that's no, a no, case. No, no, Don't, no. Don't, Don't you oversimplify this. I am really angry. Can't you see that? Corey, it's 2.15 in the morning. If I can fall asleep in a half an hour, I get about five no, no, hours no. sleep. Come on, I'll tell you what I, wait, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll call you from court oh. tomorrow. We can fight over the phone. You will not go to sleep. You will stay right here and fight to save our marriage. Sorry, sorry, Corey. I, you know what? I'm tired. I want to just jump into our beautiful bed. And if you care to join me, no, 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 we no. will be sleeping no, you, tonight. We you, sleep from left you to right. Won't discuss it? You're afraid to discuss it. But, 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 Mary, but, 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 wait a, minute. a coward. Wait a minute, Corey, bring a bucket. There's oh. leaking in the closet. It's oh, I dripping. hate you. I hate you. Really, really, really hate you. Corey, come on. There's one thing I learned in court. Be careful when you're tired and angry. You might say something you will soon regret. Like, now I am tired and angry. And? And oh, I will say something I will soon regret. Okay, Corey, maybe you're right. Maybe we have nothing in common. Maybe we rushed into this marriage too soon. Maybe love isn't the answer. Maybe, maybe people should take more than a blood test. Maybe they should take a test on common sense, understanding, and emotional maturity. Oh, right. Why don't you get it passed in the Supreme Court? Only those couples bearing a letter from their psychiatrist proving that they're well-adjusted will be permitted to be married. You're impossible. Now you're unbearable. Oh God, you belong in a nursery school. Oh, well, it's a lot more fun than the, the home for buddy duddies. All right, Corey, come on. Let, oh, no, let's, no, 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 let's oh, not... no, don't you touch me. Don't you touch me. I, I don't want you near me ever again. Now, wait a minute, no, 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 Corey. No, no, no. I, can't, I can't even look at you. I can't even be in the same room as you now. Why? <sighs> I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I can't. That's all. I can't. I, not when you feel this way. But I feel what way? The way you feel about me. Corey, you're hysterical. I'm not hysterical. <sighs> I know exactly what I'm saying. It's no good between us, Paul. And it, it never will be again. Holy crap. Oh, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I don't want to cry. Oh, for Pete's sake, go ahead and cry. Oh, don't tell me when to cry. I'm going to cry when I want to cry, okay? And I'm not going to have my cry until you're out of this apartment. What do you mean out of this apartment? What do you mean out of this apartment? Oh, you don't, well, you certainly don't think that, that we're going to live here together, do you? After tonight? Are you serious? What? Of course I'm serious. I want a divorce. Uh, <sighs> a di a, di a divorce? What? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but I, I can't discuss it anymore, okay? Good night. Wait, wait a minute, where are you going? I'm going to bed. You can't, you can't now. Oh, well, you did before. Well, that was in the middle of a fight. 
this is in the middle of a, of a divorce. Oh, I, I really, I, I can't talk to you when you're hysterical. Oh, come on, will you please wait come minute, here? I, I, wait a minute, I, you know what? I, I just want to know why you want a divorce. I told you why. It's because you and I have absolutely nothing in common. But wait, wait a minute. What about the beautiful time we had at, at the Plaza Hotel? Six days at the Plaza Hotel. Six, six days? Does not a week make? Well, wait, wait a minute. What does that mean? We are in a lecture hall on the campus of a small Midwestern college. On the first day of class, Tanya, a political science major, wanders into Professor Klump's course, The Art of Lying, mistaking it for a course on ethics. That's our advanced leadership course. Armed with carefully crafted lies, you can become the ultimate politician, master lawyer, salesman of the year. You enter this course at the level of little white, little white liar, but under my tutelage, you become a master liar with your pants on fire. To achieve the rank of pants on fire, you must be willing to dedicate yourself to this course above all your other courses. You must be willing to be the best deceiver of anyone you know. Lying is an art. Being a master liar is a way of life. My experience in fabrication comes from practicing law, both as an attorney and as a judge. I've also collaborated in numerous plural campaigns. Uh, is there a problem? Why are you leaving? Oh, well, I think I'm in the wrong class. I signed up for ethics. Ah, uh, fate has brought you to us. Besides, your ethics class was canceled. What? Are you sure? I'm positive. Well, I just checked on it this morning. The class wasn't full. Why would they cancel? Wait, you're lying, aren't you? Why, why waste your time with ethics? Ethics only slow you down in life, but lies will set you free. Well, I thought lying was bad. Uh, you got nowhere with an attitude like that. Well, nowhere is better than where you're going. <laughs> Let me give you a test. Would you rather support an honest politician who disagrees with what you believe in or a dishonest one it agrees with you. And let's say the honest politician succeeds in what you don't believe in, the dishonest one fails. You're worse off if you supported the honest one. Smart politician lies and tells you what you want to hear. He may even try to get you what you want. So why bother with the honest one? Well, the political system is so corrupt. I mean, there's no, no such thing as an honest politician anymore. Is the honest person really that honest or there's a better liar? Everybody is hiding something. The person that appears clean, just a better liar. You're really twisting this around. Oh, what a tangled web you weave. Ugh. You apply this to business too. Please don't, please don't. To law. Well, there's no surprise there. Lawyers create truth to free, to defend. To be successful, their lie must be so convincing that they believe it themselves. Everything is corrupt. It's all a lie. I challenge you to come up with one arena that's fabrication free. Well, how about education? Ah, uh, biggest lie of all. What? How? Education reflects the ideas of those in power. History is written by those in power. What we teach here is a lot different than what they teach in North Korea, for example. Yeah, but that's a whole different country with a crazy dictator. Yeah, but, but it's the same here. Do you think what, what teachers teach students in Seattle is the same as what they teach in Dallas? Yeah, it's basically the same. Ever heard of evolution? Of course. You think they teach evolution the same in Dallas as they do in Seattle? Oh, so conservatives are stupid is what you're saying. No, liberals could be stupid too. Some schools in Maryland and New York are banned Christmas. Christmas is my favorite time of year. 
best time to live a lie. So now you're saying Christmas is a lie? Biggest lie of all. Santa, Santa, he's a huge lie. Parents tell their children to keep them happy. You're confusing lies with stories. Yeah, but we love to tell our children these stories are true. So you're saying that everything we believe in is just a lie. Even our heroes are liars. People admire actors. They make their living at lying. Athletes aren't much better. They, they're violent, still do drugs. Well, there are some heroes who tell the truth and uh, force us all to see through the lies, like Martin Luther King Jr. Shot. Gandhi. Shot. Mother Teresa. Oh, I'll give you that one. Oh, so I win? What? I win. I found someone who's honest and truthful and good. I mean, she's somebody that I could look up to and admire and emulate. My friend, you are no Mother Teresa. Thanks. Well, I'm off to find some hungry people to feed and some sick people to take care of. All right, class. Your homework is to find something on Mother Teresa. No one could be that famous and done that much without hiding something. Find me some dirt. I want to take that woman down. In a nefarious conservatorship proceeding, Mrs. Chandler's parasitic son, Chase, has retained the equally parasitic attorney, Mr. Weasel, in an attempt to have his wealthy mother, mother declared unfit to manage her affairs so he can gain control of her money. <clears throat> Ms. Chandler, do you know why you're here today? Apparently to waste my time being subjected to some random line of existential questioning by some dullard who clearly obtained their law degree at some unaccredited online school based in Honduras. You already moved out that last comment stricken on the grounds that it is non-responsive and rude. Oh, <laughs> don't expect the judge to rule on that, Mr. Weasel. He's busy texting somebody. For your information, it's Mr. Weasel. Oh, pardon me, but your resemblance to the four-legged creature was confusing to me. Aha, so you admit to being confused. No, I don't. It's just that I'm looking at somebody who looks and acts like a rodent. The petitioner is alleging that you should be declared a conservative of the court. I'm not a conservative. I've always voted Democratic. Ms. Chandler, do you understand your son is alleging that you are unfit to make medical, legal, or financial decisions on your own? The only example of my inability to make a medical decision was when I didn't terminate the pregnancy that brought your client into this world. How can you be so stone-hearted to talk about your son like that? Ugh, my sin. Your son? Oh, excuse the Freudian slip. And before you try and accuse me of being confused again, let me clarify for the record that I'm not referring to lingerie. My sin has cost me nothing but millions of dollars in his failed business ventures, various lawsuits, marriages, divorces. Can you recall a specific example of that? Yes, I can. He sank a million dollars into a company that made dial-up telephones just when cell phones were being introduced. Would you like me to list all of his other boondoggle decisions that were as doomed as the Titanic? No, thank you. Do you recall the time a few months ago when your son came over and found the keys to all of your cars in the refrigerator? Yes, I do. So you admit to misplacing your car keys in the refrigerator? No, they weren't misplaced at all. I deliberately put them there thinking he'd never open the fridge because he's on a liquid booze diet. Usually they're safe there and the only place they wouldn't be safe was in the liquor cabinet. So no, Mr. Wizzle Waffle, they were not misplaced at all. It's Mr. Wizzell. Please don't interrupt me. Every time he got a hold of my car keys, he'd wreck one of my cars. Three vintage classic cars 
total in the last year alone, the demise of my 64 Aston Martin DB5 broke my heart and the loss of my Bugatti Royale. Oh. So sorry for your loss. Moving on, isn't it true you suffer from severe mental limitations? If you're going to open the door to severe mental limitations, you better fasten your seatbelt. Your half wit of a client who failed to show up today, flunked out of the sixth grade, was expelled from high school two times for living up to the high part, and never made it into college or the Boy Scouts in spite of the extremely generous donations we offered. Your Honor, motion to strike is non-responsive. Oh, <laughs> don't bother the judge. He's busy working on the New York Times crossword puzzle. And from what I could see, he's doing quite well. Well, from what I can see, it's obvious you're representing yourself. What happened to your former counsel? I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you what happened. I fired him after the last deposition because he instructed me to answer every question with, I don't recall. So since the objective of this trial is to discredit my memory, it stands to reason if I always state, I don't recall, then I would just be making your case for you. Well, let me ask you this. Do you recall the first question I asked you at your deposition? <sighs> you don't recall, do you? Unfortunately, I do recall. What was it? You asked me if they were real. I challenge you to find that question in this deposition transcript. I can't. Aha, that's because I never asked it, isn't it? No, we certainly did ask it, Mr. Sleazel. It's just not in the transcript because you asked it before my attorney and the court reporter came into the room. Please state your age for the record. <gasps> I will not. No true gentleman would ask a question like that. So I'm not surprised that you did. Your Honor, I asked the court to order the alleged conservatee to answer that question. Oh, Your Honor, Your Honor. Oh, oh, do not bother the judge. He is busy eating a pastrami on rye with a lot of mustard. Mm. Okay, let's try something else. Isn't it true you have a physical disability? <laughs> Au contraire. I do Pilates five days a week. Does this look like I'm physically disabled to you? Okay, okay. Do you recall the time several weeks ago when you forgot your sunglasses at the Hotel Bel Air restaurant? <laughs> They weren't forgotten. It was intentional. What? Have you taken leave of your senses, madam? What would possess you to leave a pair of designer sunglasses worth maybe $500 at a hotel restaurant? So the hot young waiter could bring them to me. My God, you're a cougar. It's an endangered species, you know. All right. Recite for the court the serial numbers of your two jumbo CD checking accounts. 3030719648 and 3030527233. That's correct. I know. Your Honor, excuse me, it's my client. Hello? Where are you? You've already started. You're a witness. Slow down, Chase, I can't understand you. Stop crying. What's that you say? Oh my God, hold on, hold on. Miss Chandler, that's your son. He's yeah. calling from a jail in Tijuana. He says unless he transfers funds in his checking account to the Policia Federale, they're gonna keep him there the rest of his life. What's his account number? Did, did, did you say the rest of his life? Yes, yes, what's his account number? I don't recall. <laughs> ah. Okay.
Let's see if there's a pen. It's okay. Let him in. Hello. Yeah. Okay, here. Yep. <laughs> Where's our audience? Great job. Where, where, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, audience, you can show yourselves. <laughs> Excellent job. Excellent. Yeah. Hard work pays off. Yes. <laughs> There's Laura Lips. Thank you, Laura, for everything. Oh, Hi, Michael. <laughs> hey, Richard. My wonderful okay. daughter. Mm -hmm. Hi, my friends, Marcia, Susan, Bernie. Rosa, Carol. Rosa, go. where did Rosa go? Bravo, actors. Bravo. Bravo. Yeah, bravo. Good job.